Hello and welcome back to our series on classical mechanics. This is lecture number 15 and we begin our discussion on the topic escape velocity. If we consider the energy diagram for inverse square law force and suppose that an object is trapped within the potential well for a particular value of energy. Let's consider a value of a certain level of energy and for this particular energy level an object is bounded within this region R1 and R2. So this is the potential well and we have a particle trapped in this particular well. Now the question that we want to ask is what kind of the trajectory of this particle under the influence of, a, of an attractive inverse square law force is going to look like. So there can be two cases. The first case would be let's say an object is shot from the surface of the earth with a particular velocity v. Then what happens? It will move a particular distance and then come back again to the surface of the earth like throwing a ball. And the other case could be if we throw it with some different velocity let's say v1 then what happens? Then it's going to move in such a way that we have an elliptical orbit. So this is the case of a artificial satellite that orbits the planet Earth. Now what will be the minimum amount of velocity that will be required by the particle in order to escape attractive potential of the earth such that can the object can move freely and away from the earth's surface never to return back. So this particular velocity is referred to as the escape velocity. Coming back to our energy diagram, for an object that is trapped in this particular potential well or within the bound states can only come out of this well if we let the object move to a certain distance where the potential drops to zero. That means we know that the effective potential is given by negative k over r. So this is the potential due to the uh, inverse square law force plus the fictitious term which is L squared over 2m r squared. So V effective, so that's going to approaching the value 0, R approaches infinity. So in a way we are saying that for an inverse square force field, we know that the force field extends all the way up to infinity. So that means escape velocity is going to be the minimum velocity that is required to take the object to infinity. Now, we know that because only a minimum velocity is required to take an object to infinity, it would mean that at infinity, it's going to have a zero velocity. Now, if we consider the value of energy, which is the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy, and since we have velocity going to zero at infinity, so we have half m zero squared and the potential value also dropping to zero at infinity, so that means we have energy value equals to zero at infinity. Now because energy is conserved that would mean that the energy initially should also be conserved meaning we are saying that E minimum or E initially which is the sum of the kinetic energy here this kinetic energy will be the minimum velocity that is required to escape the potential well that will be half mv E squared plus V of R and this will be equals to zero. So half mv e squared equals to negative v of r. So v e squared, so that will be negative two v of r, all divided by m. And the escape velocity will be square root of negative two v of r, all divided by m. Now if we consider the case of earth, let's say we have earth, of radius given by r naught, then this potential v of r will be given by negative g m, where m is the mass of the planet, m divided by r naught, where m will be the mass of the object which is trying to escape the attractive force or the attractive pull of the earth. Here, what we have done is neglected the distance between the earth's surface and the object. That means we have considered the radius of the earth R0 value to be extremely large compared to the distance of separation between the earth and the object. So let's replace this value here. So we have 
negative 2 times g m m divided by m times r naught so this is negative so this will give us 2 g m over r naught so this is the expression for escape velocity which will be used by an object usually a satellite or a rocket that's trying to escape the gravitational pull of the earth now from newton's second law of motion we know that m times g which is the force on the object that's trying to escape the gravitational pull of the earth so that will be equals to g m m over r naught squared so this is the gravitational force so from here we have g equals to g m over r naught squared or simply g r naught squared so that will be equals to g m so what we can do we can replace this g m with g r naught squared such that our expression for the escape velocity will then becomes 2 times g r naught squared divided by r naught which is simply 2 times g r naught so if we consider the value of g to be 9.8 meters per second squared and the radius of r to be approximately 6400 kilometers then this escape velocity value comes out to be 11.2 kilometers per per second so this is the escape velocity that is required by an object to escape from the gravitational pull of the earth now that we have an expression for the escape velocity what we'll try to do next is we'll have different initial conditions and we'll check how that different initial conditions is going to lead us to different orbits such as the parabolic orbit hyperbolic orbit or circular orbit so we begin by considering the earth's surface so here r naught is going to represent the radius of the earth so let's say this is the earth's radius given by r naught now what we're going to do we are going to let's say this is the radial distance let us consider an object which has been shot upwards with a velocity of v and making an angle alpha with this radial direction now what we can do here we can write the eccentricity so that is given by square root of one plus we have two e l squared divided by m k squared so let this be equation number one now we have the expression for the energy which is given by half m times v squared minus v e squared so what we'll do we'll take this value of energy and substitute into equation number one such that the expression for eccentricity will be given by one plus two l squared divided by m k squared times half m v squared minus v e squared so this becomes square root of one plus so here we see that few terms gets immediately cancelled out so the two and two m and m gets cancelled out we are left with l squared divided by k squared times v squared minus v e squared so our task will be to replace the value of l and k with the value v v e and alpha so let us do that for that we will start with the angular momentum which is the l so we have already defined the value of angular momentum so we have angular momentum which is defined as the cross product between the radial vector r with the the linear momentum p vector so in our case so this is a vector quantity in our case the radius vector is the earth's radius r naught vector cross with the linear momentum which will be m times v vector this is l vector now if we consider only the magnitude so l will be m v r naught times sine of the angle between r vector and p vector which is simply alpha so we have an expression for l here now we need to find an expression for k so we have the kinetic energy which is half m v e squared so this will be equals to the potential calculated at the surface of the earth v of r naught so this is negative 
Now we know that the surface of the earth, so that's simply given by negative k over r naught. So this is k over r naught. And we have half m v e squared. So that means in terms of k, my equation then will become m v e squared r naught divided by 2. So this is the expression for k. So now that we have l and k, so we substitute this back into our eccentricity. So our eccentricity will then become epsilon equals to square root of 1 plus. So we have L squared. So L squared will be M squared V squared R naught squared times sine squared alpha all divided by K squared. So K squared will be M squared V E. So we already have a V E squared here. So that will be V E raised to the power of 4 times r naught squared and divided by 4. So that's we multiply with a factor 4. This will be multiplied to v squared minus v e squared. Right. On doing so, we'll see that a few of the terms will cancel out. So the m squared gets factored out, r naught squared gets factored out, and our value for epsilon will be 1 plus 4 times v squared sine squared alpha divided by so we have v e raised to the power of 4 so we'll take v e squared multiply to v squared minus v e squared divided by v e squared so this gives us epsilon equals to square root of 1 plus 2 times v over v e times sine alpha whole squared multiply to v squared over v e squared minus 1. Fine. And this will be equals to square root of 1 plus 2c sine alpha whole squared multiplied to c squared minus 1, where we're replacing v over v with the value c. So this is the new expression for eccentricity in terms of the escape velocity v e and we also have the angle alpha now what we can do using this equation for eccentricity we can now determine what type of orbit the particular object with which it was shot into space is going to have so let's start with the first one let's say we have a circular orbit so what are the conditions required for circular orbit all we know that if we have a circular orbit, then the epsilon value must be equals to zero. That's the first condition. But this would mean that this particular expression, which is 1 plus 2c sine alpha whole squared times c squared minus 1, so this must be equals to zero. So let's expand this. So this is going to give us 1 plus. So we have 2c sine alpha whole squared, so that's simply 4c squared sine squared alpha multiplied to c squared minus 1 equals to 0. Or we have 1 plus 4c raised to the power of 4 sine squared alpha minus 4c squared sine squared alpha, and that's equals to 0. Now what we'll do, we will add... 4c raised to the power of 4 times sine alpha all raised to the power of 4. It's both sides. 4c raised to the power of 4 times sine alpha all raised to the power of 4. This is done so that we can combine the first term, the third term, and the fourth term together. So here we are going to use the identity. Let me write it down in a proper way. So we have 1, and we'll take this term to the uh, right hand side. So we have 1 minus 2 times 2c squared sine squared alpha. So this is how we have rewritten the third term plus the fourth term. So that will be 2c squared sine squared alpha whole squared. And we have 4c raised to the power of 4 times sine alpha whole raised to the power of 4 minus the second term which you have taken to the right hand side. So that's 4c raised to the power of 4 times sine squared alpha. So this is an identity. 
So this will be 1 minus 2 c squared sine squared alpha whole squared. And that was equals to 4 c raised to the power of 4 times sine squared alpha multiplied to sine squared alpha minus 1. Now let's say we have alpha equals to pi over 2. Now let's look at the equation on the right hand side. So here we have sine squared alpha minus 1. So if we replace alpha with pi over 2, we know that sine pi over 2, that's 1. So this entire expression on the right hand side is going to be equals to 0. And since we have an equality here, so this particular equation is going to hold if this particular expression 1 minus 2 c squared sine squared alpha if that is also equals to 0 for alpha equals to pi over 2. So that means we have 1 minus 2 c squared so here uh, alpha is pi over 2 so that's simply 1 equals to 0 and that gives us the value of c which is 1 over square root of 2. So this is a condition that we have obtained that means for a circular orbit for a circular orbit that means the eccentricity is zero when our angle alpha is pi over two and here we have c so c is simply v over the escape velocity equals to one over root two so when we have these two conditions then we say that we have a circular orbit so this is the condition that needs to be satisfied. Now what we will do next is we will consider elliptical orbits. So we again consider the equation of the eccentricity. So that's 1 plus 4 c squared sine squared alpha times c squared minus 1. Or we can also rewrite it as 1 minus 4 c squared times sine squared alpha so instead of c squared minus 1 we have 1 minus c squared so this sign will change from positive to negative now we know that in a case of an elliptical orbit the eccentricity value must lie between 0 and 1 so this is a condition that we are already aware of so our task will now be to obtain the value of the parameters alpha and c we will see that once we have the value of c, we can obtain the value of the velocity and there will be three values of velocity v for which will, will give us an elliptical orbit. So let me state it. The first one will be when our velocity v is equals to ve over square root of 2. This is similar to the one that we obtained for circular orbit with, with a small adjustment that the alpha is not equals to pi over 2 it's with a different angle then in that case it's going to be an elliptical orbit the second case is when the velocity is such that it's less than the escape velocity ve but it is greater than ve over square root of 2 so this is one case and the third one is we have a velocity which is greater than 0 but it is going to be less than ve over square root of we will try to derive an expression for the velocity as stated in 2 and 3. However, before doing that, I'd like to state here that the 2 and 3 are very special case. For 2, we have the case of a satellite that's going in an elliptical path. And for the case as given by 3, that will be for a ballistic missile. So we have the two broad classification within elliptical orbit. Consider the Earth whose radius is given by r naught and let's say we shoot an object up in space with a velocity of v and with an angle alpha with the radial distance now assuming that this velocity v is less than the escape velocity then what is going to happen is going to go in an elliptical trajectory now since it's an elliptical trajectory, we have to assume that the center of the Earth is going to lie on one of the foci of the ellipse. 
and there is also a condition then this will be the distance will be the shortest distance of the object to the earth and this will be given by the semi minor axis b so we have a condition here so if b is greater than ana then what we have we have an elliptical path of a satellite and in the other case when we have the length of the semi minor axis b less than the radius of the earth then we have an elliptical path for a ballistic missile so we will use this fact now let us try to define the value of b we know that b is given by b equals to a times square root of 1 minus epsilon squared and the value of a is given by l divided by 1 minus epsilon squared now we'll substitute the value of a into b to get l divided by 1 minus epsilon squared times square root of 1 minus epsilon squared and that will be equals to l divided by square root of 1 minus epsilon squared so what we do need to do next is to replace the value of l and epsilon with the known parameters that means the velocity v alpha and the radius of earth so let's do that so we know the, the value of l so that's given by l squared which is angular momentum squared divided by m times k and the k is defined as m p e squared r naught divided by 2. so if we substitute this value of k in l so our l will be equals to 2L squared divided by M squared VE squared times R naught. So this is the value of L. Now we have to work with our eccentricity. So our eccentricity is defined as, so we'll square both sides. So that will give us epsilon squared. So that equals to 1 minus 4C squared sine squared alpha times 1 minus C squared. And we have 1 minus epsilon squared, so that will be equals to 4c squared sine squared alpha times 1 minus c squared. So we'll take the square root on both sides, so we have 1 minus epsilon squared. We take the square root, so that will be equals to 2c sine alpha times 1 square root of 1 minus c squared. So here we have considered a positive square root. So we have square root of 1 minus epsilon squared and we also have a value of L. So let's uh, substitute this value into our equation of B. So we have B to L squared divided by M squared B E squared R naught. So this is the value of small L and we have square root of 1 minus epsilon squared. So that will be 2C sine alpha times square root of 1 minus c squared now we also had an expression for the angular momentum l which is given by m b r naught times sine alpha so we'll substitute this value here so our b value will be equals to so we have 2 times m squared v squared r naught squared times sine squared alpha all divided by m squared b e squared times r naught so we have two here times c times sine alpha times square root of one minus c squared we will see that some of the terms will get cancelled out so the m squared m squared two two one r naught and one sine alpha so they gets cancelled out so that leaves us with b equals to so we have v squared r naught sine alpha in the numerator divided by b e squared times c times square root of 1 minus c squared so we have c which is equals to v over v e so we have e squared over b e squared so that will be c squared times r naught times sine alpha divided by c times square root of 1 minus c squared so this c and the c in the numerator gets cancelled and we have an expression c times r naught times sine alpha 
all divided to square root of 1 minus c squared. Now we'll divide both sides with r naught such that we have b over r naught. So that's equals to c times sine alpha uh, divided by square root of 1 minus c squared. So now we'll obtain the conditions for velocity in order to have an elliptical path for both the two cases, the satellite as well as the ballistic missile. For the satellite's case, we consider that the value of the semi-major axis B that must be greater than the radius of R, Earth. So this simply means we have B over R naught, so that's greater than 1. So in place of B over R naught, we have C sine alpha, all divided by square root of 1 minus C squared. So this is greater than 1. So let's solve this inequality. We have C sine alpha greater than square root of 1 minus C squared, or C squared sine squared alpha greater than 1 minus C squared. We have C squared sine squared alpha plus C squared greater than 1. C squared, we have 1 plus sine squared alpha greater than 1. Or C squared greater than 1 over 1 over 1 plus sine squared alpha. Or simply C greater than 1 over square root of 1 plus sine squared alpha. So here we can have two values. So one value will be the maximum value of C. So that will be equals to 1, which is obtained when the alpha value is equals to 0. And the minimum value of C that will be equals to 1 over square root of 2 when alpha will be equals to pi over 2. So that means the value of C. So it's going to lie between C minimum and C maximum. So C minimum it's 1 over square root of 2. C is C. And maximum is 1. And we know that c is equals to the velocity v divided by the skip velocity ve. So multiplying throughout by skip velocity, we have ve over square root of 2. So this particular expression. So this is the condition for elliptical path for a satellite. Right. Similarly, we can show this for the ballistic missile as well we can determine the condition so we have b is less than r naught so that means b over r naught so this is going to be less than one we can do the same calculation as we worked out above so that will be c less than one over square root of one plus sine squared alpha so we know that the maximum value of sine squared alpha that will be 1 and the minimum value will be 0. So if we use this condition, then we have the value of C will be less than 1 over square root of 2. And it will be greater than 0, a positive value. Or in other words, we can say that the velocity will lie between 0 and, and 1 over square root of 2 times the escape velocity VE. And this is the condition for the elliptical path for a ballistic missile. Now that we have defined the condition for velocity in the case of a satellite as well as a ballistic missile, so what we'll try to do is find the range of a ballistic missile. So let us begin by considering the Earth's surface. So this is the center of the Earth. The Earth has a radius of R naught. Now, this is the horizontal axis. Now, let us suppose that a particle is shot upwards. This is the missile that has been shot upwards with a velocity of v. So, this angle, let this angle be alpha. Now, suppose that the trajectory of the missile will be such that it's going to move in an elliptical path and then it's going to come back and again hit another different location on the surface of the Earth. So this is the trajectory of this particular missile. Now what we want to do, we want to 
obtained the range of this ballistic missile or what we want to do we want to determine the value of this arc length now for that let's consider another point on the missile and this point will be such that it's an, an angle phi with the horizontal axis now we also have the apogee distance so apogee will be the distance at which the missile will be at maximum from the center of the ellipse so here the earth center is considered to be the force center which is at one of the foci of the ellipse so this let's join this so this distance is the apsidal distance or the distance of the apogee point of the missile from the center of the earth now this is also making some angle let's say with the horizontal axis it's making an angle of phi naught and this particular point point p is making an angle theta with this axis of the elliptical path and so we have three parameters we have theta phi phi naught now what will be the equation of orbit for this particular scenario so we know that if we have an ellipse suppose the particle is going in the anti-clockwise fashion and our forces center is at f1 then in that case the equation of the orbit is given by l over r is equals to 1 plus epsilon times cosine of theta now if we have the force center instead of at f1 if we have the force center at f2 in that case the equation of the ellipse there will be a slight adjustment so that will be l over r equals to 1 minus epsilon cosine of theta so the plus sign will get replaced with negative sign so let's use this equation so our equation of the orbit is l over r because if we look at this because we have the earth's center or the forces center at this particular foci so we have one uh, foci here and another foci here so l over r is equals to 1 minus epsilon types cosine of theta and we know l value so that's l square over m k times r equals to 1 minus epsilon times cosine of theta now what is theta so theta is the entire angle phi minus phi naught so this is the angular momentum l and we also have defined the value of l so l was found out to be so this is the value for angular momentum and we have the k so the k was so we will substitute the value of l and k into this particular equation so this should give us so we have l squared so that will be m squared r naught squared v squared sine squared alpha whole thing divided by m times k so the k will be m so we have already an m present VE squared R naught, so we'll take the 2 to the numerator times R. So this will be equals to 1 minus epsilon times cosine of phi minus phi naught. So we have m squared term cancelling out. Now that leaves us with 2 times, so we also have an R naught cancelling out from the numerator and the denominator. So we have 2 R naught now we have v squared over v e squared so that's simply c squared times sine squared alpha all divided by r and that's equals to 1 minus epsilon times cosine of phi minus phi naught solving for r so we have a few more adjustments for what what we will do now we'll consider the initial conditions the initial conditions will be at time t equals to 0. So we have the r value equals to r naught and our value phi. So that will be equals to 0 degrees. So if we substitute this value here, so we'll get r naught. So that's equals to 2c squared r naught times sine squared alpha 
divided by 1 minus epsilon times cosine of phi naught. So we have the R naught term cancelling from both sides. And this should give us 2C squared sine squared alpha. So that will be equals to 1 minus epsilon times cosine of phi naught. So and we'll substitute this in the numerator such that R equation of orbit r will be equals to r naught times 1 minus epsilon times cosine of phi naught divided by 1 minus epsilon times cosine of phi minus phi naught so this is the equation of the orbit so this from this particular equation of the orbit we can we can now find out the value of the range so what we have to do here is like we have to find out the value of the angular displacement at the extremum or the extreme ends. So here, so we have one extreme end at this particular point and we have another extreme point. So here what we will do will simply, so this is our R. So when this point P coincides with this point, then R will be equals to R naught. So it could be either here or it could the point P could coincide here. In either case, R will be equals to R naught, and that is going to help us find out the value of phi, the angular displacement. So we are going to put the value of R with R naught. So in that case, so we have R naught, so that's equals to R naught times 1 minus epsilon times cosine of phi naught, all divided by 1 minus epsilon times cosine of phi minus phi naught. So the r naught r naught gets cancelled. Then we cross multiply to get 1 minus epsilon times cosine of phi minus phi naught. And this should be equals to 1 minus epsilon times cosine of phi naught. Or simply cosine of phi minus phi naught equals to cosine of phi naught. When we solve this, we should get the value of phi as equals to 0 and 2 phi naught. So remember this is the angle phi, which is the angle made by the projectile with the horizontal axis. So phi equals to 0 means we are at the origin and phi equals to 2 phi naught means we have reach this extreme point. So that means this entire angle, this is equals to 2 phi naught. So now that we have this particular angle, which is 2 phi naught, simply multiply with r naught. Let me redraw it again. So here we have the Earth's surface. This is the center. So this is phi equals to 0. And at the other extremum point, we have obtained phi equals to 2 phi naught. So that means this angle is to phi naught and since the radius is r naught so this particular arc length which is the range so that range will be simply equals to r naught times 2 phi naught which is equals to 2 r naught phi naught so this is going to be the range of the ballistic missile now let us consider the other two orbits so we have the centricity e given by Suppose the value of C that's equals to 1. So that means V divided by the escape velocity that's equals to 1. Or in other words, the velocity is exactly equals to the escape velocity. So if we substitute this value into our equation, so we have 1 minus C squared. So that means we have square root of 1 minus 4 times 1 squared sine squared alpha times 1 minus 1. So that gives us epsilon value. 1 minus 0, so this is 1, and this is the condition for a parabolic orbit. So that means when our velocity is exactly equal to the escape velocity, then what in this case what we'll obtain is a parabolic path. So that means if this is the earth with radius r naught, and this is this is the horizon, and we have a particle that's being shot off with a velocity making an angle alpha then it is going to go in a 
parabolic path when the velocity v is exactly equals to v e the escape velocity it's going to escape along a parabolic trajectory then in the next case what if our value of c is or greater than one so when our value of c is greater than one so in this case that means our velocity is even greater than the escape velocity then we have the eccentricity which will be 1 minus v times c squared times sine squared alpha so c is greater than 1 so that means this term is always going to be negative and we have a negative negative so this will be 1 plus some positive term so that means our eccentricity is always going to be greater than 1 and in this case we have a hyperbolic part or orbit so that means we have the earth with the radius r naught and if we're short with some velocity v v is greater than the escape velocity then this particular object is going to go on a hyperbolic trajectory with a value v greater than v e transfer of orbit so let us suppose that we have a satellite that is moving in a nearly circular orbit about the earth and this is going to have let's say an orbital radius of let's say r right now we have half mv squared so that will be equals to negative half of the potential v as a function of r this is true for a circular orbit now if we solve for the velocity that will be v is equals to now we know that since v of r so that is negative k over r so our expression for velocity will become and also k so that's given by the gravitational constant g times m the mass of the earth times the mass of the satellite so we'll substitute this in place of k so that means we have g m m so this gives us the velocity of e g m over r so here we can see that the velocity is proportional to the distance or the radius r radius of the orbit r now the question is if we want to change the orbit of this particular satellite and move to a higher orbit then how shall we do that so let's say we want to move this particular satellite to a higher orbit with radius r1 where radius r1 is greater than r so there are several ways of doing it so in this particular topic we will talk about the home and transfer so since the satellite is initially moving in a circular orbit with radius r so let's look at the energy diagram of the effective potential so we have a circular orbit so this is the lowest value of the potential which occurs for a particular energy let's call it e1 and we have a circular orbit with radius r so what we'll do in home and transfer so what we do in home and transfer we're going to apply a velocity to this particular satellite in a tangential direction v such that what we are doing is we are increasing the energy to a new level e2 now this is clear because the energy has increased so we have two bounds here so that means two turning points let's call this turning point r1 then the other one r2 right and we know that the motion which is confined within r1 and r2 is going to be elliptical in nature so it means this particular orbit will be such that it will be elliptical in nature and this motion will be such that the center of the earth is going to be at the forces center fine so in this particular case the, this is going to be a perigee point so here this is the minimum distance or the perigee distance so that will be r plus the 
apogee distance so this apogee distance will be the bigger circle of radius r1 so r plus r1 that will be equals to 2 times a which is the length of the major axis what happens when the settler is at the apogee point then this uh, let's say the settler is moving in a anti-clockwise fashion so what we will do the moment the satellite reaches the apogee point a velocity will be provided in the opposite direction so that the, the satellite now starts moving in the clockwise motion so this is a new velocity v now we're loading the energy from e2 such that our effective potential has a lower dip at the point r1 and this can be done by controlling the angular momentum in the term l squared over 2m r squared and once r energy is brought back to this new energy level e3 which has a lower potential dip at r equals to r1 now we will have a new circular orbit so this is how we have successfully transferred a satellite which was initially moving in a circular orbit about the earth with a distance of r now it is moving in a new circular orbit with a, a radius of r1 measured from the earth's center or the forces center so this is how we can transfer an orbit so we end the lecture here today in the next lecture we'll be picking up some numerical problems based on the topics and ideas that we talked about in today's lecture so see you in the next lecture thank you